thanks. Uh, many thanks, uh, first of all, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I really wish I uh, could be there uh, with you over there on such a, what it looks uh, like a beautiful day. It's not too bad here in Cambridge either, uh, but you know, the teaching and all other loads still add up uh, um, to the day. So uh, yes, um, in the beginning of the talk, I wanted to give you a brief disclaimer. Uh, I was uh, quite a bit affected by what was going on uh, in the world in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and so uh, as a result, you know, certain, you know, things related to the productivity and focus uh, have been uh, somewhat affected in my case. So uh, if you find my talk a little bit meandering, please uh, uh, excuse, excuse me uh, for that. Uh, anyway, so going back to uh, going back to science, uh, the goal of uh, the talk today, uh, as I uh, sort of try to structure it, is just to run you through some examples of uh, interesting uh, uh, interesting examples of uh, circumbinary disks uh, in astrophysics. Some of which may uh, appear conventional to you, some of which may be uh, not so conventional. So, and I'll try to be as broad as uh, possible. Uh, then I'll uh, talk about historical perspective. Uh, in particular, that would be obviously my own subjective take on uh, which papers uh, uh, have triggered my own interest in the subject uh, and I think have advanced it uh, substantially far, uh, far uh, in the future. Then I'll talk a bit about the circumbinary disk properties, how they differ from the properties of the regular accretion disks. Uh, and then if I have time, I might uh, talk a little bit about uh, planet formation, circumbinary planet formation, and how that uh, is uh, tied with the question of um, uh, the eccentricity excitation in a circumbinary disk and why it's important to study eccentricity excitation in these distorted uh, astrophysical uh, systems. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, okay, so uh, as I said, first I'll run you through some examples of um, the circumbinary disks, and uh, probably one of the first examples uh, of the of the disks uh, that uh, is sort of uh, now in love uh, that has been uh, studied and has been studied actually for uh, over a century is the system KH15D. By the way, I'll start from uh, small scales. You know, I'm going to cover multiple scales. I'll start from small scales and I'll start from stellar scales, uh, and in particular protostellar uh, disks. So this system has been uh, interesting for its unusual uh, variability pattern. Uh, it has uh, been showing uh, sort of uh, quasi-periodic uh, eclipses of varying depth, of varying uh, duration, and so on uh, for many, many decades. And uh, people have been puzzled by what's uh, going on uh, in the system. That was going on until about uh, 2004, where uh, several teams uh, of in several independent teams have actually demonstrated that the best way to understand what's going on with a photometric time series in the system is to actually postulate that uh, this system is a binary, which was sort of known before, but uh, also in addition to that, there is a circumbinary disk in this system. And this disk uh, is not of a sort of garden flattened nice variety. It actually is a disk which is uh, warped, it's misaligned, uh, and it's uh, constantly processing. And it is the procession of this disk uh, that, uh, and the disk has a pretty sharp uh, edge, uh, so uh, the procession of the disk is causing this occulting edge to cross, to sweep all the, over the orbit of the binary, and uh, to change this pattern of uh, eclipses. So this is a very nice laboratory, which uh, kind of, you know, was one of the systems where we actually got a chance to study these circumbinary disks in observations in great uh, detail. Now, these days, uh, thanks to uh, facilities uh, such as uh, ALMA, uh, we can study some other interesting systems. Some of them, you know, are simpler. Some of them are very uh, complicated. Like, for example, this system GW, uh, Orioni that was uh, again uh, quite recently studied by uh, several uh, different uh, groups using uh, ALMA, using direct imaging, uh, using uh, uh, SEDs uh, and so on and so forth. So what you can see in this system, you know, this is uh, actually not a circumbinary, this is a circumtriple uh, disk, which as you will see soon is a pretty common uh, occurrence. So in this uh, circumtriple system, you have an hierarchical uh, triple, uh, one of the components is a small binary in itself with a separation of about one AU and then uh, there is a, uh, the outer binary has a separation of eight AU. And what you can see is that this uh, central binary, which is small on this scale, uh, is surrounded by a large disk of uh, gas and dust. Uh, and this disk is extending over hundreds of uh, astronomical uh, units, but in the inner part of the disk, you see very intricate pattern of uh, 
eccentric and misaligned uh, dust strings, um, gaps, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this uh, very complicated structure arising around this uh, multiple systems is very, very interesting. And in particular, the modeling that has been uh, done recently, again, by several groups is showing that this system is actually a very good example of uh, a disk in which one can uh, get effects such as disk uh, tearing and breaking, something uh, that I'm sure will be discussed a lot uh, uh, during this uh, conference. This is basically what happens when there is a strong uh, torque out of the disk plane that tries to uh, misalign uh, the disk and actually, in some cases, it leads to the uh, disk uh, being broken, like what is shown in this uh, simulation from Rajat and uh, Nixon. Uh, this is another example of a disk now uh, studied with uh, direct imaging. This is a very well-known system, GGTAU. This system is actually a quintuple system. It has, you know, in principle, five stars, a binary uh, very far away. And then there is a triple, uh, again, triple in the middle. So in this case, the triple is, uh, the outer triple is separate, the outer binary, sorry, is separated by about 60U. It's somewhat eccentric. And then <clears throat> there is a circumbinary disk surrounding this uh, external external binary. What you can see is that the structures uh, seen in scattered light are quite interesting. You can see some uh, shadows or bridges uh, in this disk. You can see a very nice uh, cavity in the center of the disk. You can see matter actually present within this cavity. And if you look at this uh, system, you uh, and sort of uh, recall some of the talks that you maybe have heard already or will uh, hear during these days, what you see is actually a very good uh, sort of uh, observational representation of what we see in many of the simulations. You can see these uh, streamers of gas, you can see you know, bright stuff approaching uh, the components of this binary and so on and so forth. So this is uh, actually quite uh, uh, quite uh, interesting and so shows that the nature is uh, showing us something that we also see in our uh, theoretical models. Yet another funny, funny system, you know, as I said, I will be uh, trying to uh, entertain you with a lot of uh, weird, uh, weird uh, objects. Uh, this system is HD 98800. Uh, so this system is, again, it's a multiple system. It's a quadruple system. Uh, there are two binary uh, stars. The one which is interesting is the BABB binary, which has a semi major axis of about one astronomical unit. And what's interesting, uh, this binary has a very high eccentricity. The eccentricity is 0.79. And recently, uh, the work done by Grant Kennedy and others, again, using ALMA, has demonstrated that the disk, that the system has a disk that was uh, sort of known before. But these days, uh, uh, this uh, recent uh, work has demonstrated that the disk is actually not uh, lying in the plane of the binary. It actually lies uh, in a plane which is uh, perpendicular to the upsidal line of the binary. So that because, you know, in a secular approximation, if you think about this binary, it's kind of, you know, very strongly elongated. So it makes sense for the disk to align perpendicular to this uh, binary. And um, uh, I also hope that there will be some discussions and some of the talks of about how this misalignment process could be happening, how an initially aligned disk in such a highly eccentric binary can actually realign itself and become orthogonal to the binary of sidal, uh, sidal axis. Uh, this is all touching uh, so far on the protostellar disks. Uh, there are also evidence. There is also evidence for circumbinary disks uh, in the uh, old uh, binaries. And for all by old binaries here, I mean, uh, for example, so-called post-AGB stars. Post-AGB stars, as the name suggests, are the stars that have passed uh, through the AGB phase. They lost a, lo a lot of uh, uh, mass, and they are moving uh, uh, towards the left uh, side of the HR diagram to become eventually white dwarfs. So they are kind of shrinking. They're relatively small in size, but they are still uh, very bright and quite visible. It has been known for quite a while that these uh, post-AGB binaries actually, uh, uh, that many of these post-AGB stars are in binaries, and these binaries are actually quite eccentric. This is what uh, this diagram in the bottom uh, is uh, showing. So many of these systems with periods of, uh, let's say, you know, on the order of uh, several years, actually have, have pretty high eccentricities. And that's not what uh, you expect because uh, you know that, you know, the stars, uh, the star that is now on the uh, post-AGB phase at some point was very large. So it must have been circularized by tidal effects. And the uh, population synthesis uh, estimates uh, sort of suggest that this circularization should be happening out to the period of about 3,000 days. 
so which is obviously not what we see here. There is a lot of these binaries which are still uh, which still have very high uh, eccentricities. So one of the ideas is that uh, these binaries actually might retain some of the mass that they are losing in the form of the circumbinary disk, and we actually do see evidence for such uh, circumbinary disks in uh, polarization signatures uh, coming from these uh, stars, in uh, thermal dust emission, and so on and so forth. So then uh, one idea that was proposed is that by uh, Derman, Anteniaris, and others is that maybe the gravitational coupling of the binary with this uh, disk might actually lead to driving of the eccentricity, as uh, suggested a long time ago by Steve Lubo and Pavel Artemovitz in 1996. Uh, I did look at this problem myself, and uh, given the low masses of such disks uh, that are present in these systems, uh, they are on the order of uh, maybe typically less than a percent as expected, um, it doesn't seem very likely that this is the case, but still, the very presence of these uh, circumbinary disks is very interesting. I mean, it might still be uh, related somehow to this eccentricity maintaining or excitation. There is also a possibility of the uh, second uh, generation planet production, circumbinary planet production in uh, these disks of material which might uh, be present around these post-AGB stars. And that by itself is also a very interesting possibility. Now, going on to larger scales, well, I'll very briefly touch on a topic of uh, circumbinary disks around uh, on much larger scales. In this case, uh, I will be talking about supermassive black hole binaries. Of course, uh, uh, supermassive black hole binaries are still uh, something that uh, is somewhat elusive for, for us, despite a number of claims in recent years that we uh, have detected them or some observational signatures or will detect them soon via their merger. Uh, so anyway, so the idea is that we believe that uh, galaxies tend to grow by mergers and uh, that galaxies harbor uh, supermassive black holes in their centers. So when galaxies uh, collide, when they merge, uh, black holes tend to uh, kind of end up in the center of the combined galaxy. And so if you look at this you know, merger tree, basically the supermassive black holes from each of the components of the merger tree will be ending up in the center of the galaxy and then something should be happening to them there. Now, what uh, this something would be uh, is uh, initially we believe that uh, stellar dynamical processes would be quite important for the orbital evolution of these binaries. In particular, dynamical friction against uh, the halo of the combined uh, galaxy would be bringing uh, the binary, uh, would be bringing the components, these this, uh, individual black holes, uh, on a relatively short time scale towards the center of the galaxy. But then uh, all the, at least old estimates which assumed spherical, spherically symmetric halos, uh, did find the so-called uh, last parsec problem, which is that uh, the time scale, the residence time of the binaries, uh, um, has, uh, would, be, would be becoming very long when the separation between the binary components would be on the order of uh, parsec or so. Uh, this, again, you know, the caveat is that uh, these this, uh, calculations uh, have assumed that the stellar halo would be perfectly spherical. And if uh, a triaxiality of the halo is allowed, uh, then we know that uh, low cone filling uh, can become possible, then the stalling of the binaries might uh, be prevented, and maybe stellar dynamical processes might actually lead uh, to uh, the binaries breaking through this uh, last uh, parsec problem. So there is still a lot of ongoing work in the world of uh, n-body simulations, uh, galactic uh, sort of uh, dynamic simulations, in this area. Uh, and understanding this problem is obviously very important. It's important uh, uh, from the point of view of, uh, you know, the, just the knowledge of uh, the physics of these objects, but also because uh, there are important implications for the gravitational wave astronomy, in particular uh, for gravitational space-based gravitational wave antennae, such as uh, LISA, uh, or for uh, pulsar timing arrays, uh, for in which case we would be measuring the background Ground, the gravitational wave background produced by uh, the whole population of uh, such uh, supermassive uh, black hole binaries. So this is definitely a problem that is worth uh, exploring, and I'm sure these different aspects of, of uh, uh, what I uh, just said will be again mentioned uh, during the conference. But from the point of view of uh, the accretion and orbital evolution, what's interesting for us in the systems is that they might also possess gaseous disks around them. This is quite natural because uh, we know that, uh, for example, centers of many galaxies harbor quasars. Quasars are fed by the gas, so gas must be falling somehow to the center of the galaxy. 
And from the peon point of view of the galaxy, you know, delivering of gas from the kiloparsec scales to, let's say, sub sub parsec scales, it doesn't matter whether you have a binary in the center or just a single black hole. So gas should be present, uh, and gas uh, so gas uh, should be naturally present also around binary black holes. There was an idea, sort of. Um, uh, starting uh, in the 90s or so, that the presence of this gas might actually help us uh, shrink uh, shrink the binary. The idea was that there would be a gravitational exchange between the binary and uh, the surrounding disk that would lead to the loss of angular momentum of the binary and uh, to uh, the reduction of its orbit. Uh, there was some recent work, which I'm sure will uh, get a lot of attention at this conference uh, by uh, Ryan Miranda and his collaborators by Diego Munoz, Dong Lai, and others, uh, that actually demonstrated that this might not be the case, that in particular they show that under some circumstances the binary orbit might be expanding. So I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later on uh, in, the, in, in the talk, but even, even let's suppose that even, you know, the effect of the gas on orbital evolution is uh, the opposite to what we expect, or if uh, it's, you know, if we don't even know what, what it is, uh, still presence of the gas is going to be very important. Because the uh, presence of gas allows us to see many ele electromagnetic uh, counterparts of these uh, interesting objects. Uh, one would expect things such as uh, double or variable uh, emission lines varying on time scales of maybe months or years. One would expect uh, photometric periodicity uh, caused by the orbital motion of these uh, black holes. Possibility of self lensing becomes quite uh, obvious in this case for uh, edge on systems. You can see double jets uh, and so on and so forth. All this would be enabled by the presence of the gas around these uh, systems. So that's uh, what makes them quite interesting, uh, even uh, regardless of whether the gas is causing the orbital evolution of the black holes in the right uh, direction. Okay, uh, finally, one uh, sort of somewhat exotic uh, type of uh, binary, bin binary, binaries in disks uh, that have uh, been kind of coming um, uh, becoming becoming quite an interesting topic are the binaries embedded uh, in the disks in, in in the disks so for example if you have a quasar disk again around a supermassive black hole let's say single supermassive black hole in a center uh, you might have a binary composed of the two compact objects for example a couple of black holes uh, that are actually orbiting within this disk and this uh, the type of hydrodynamic flow that forms in this case, uh, forms around the binary, is quite different from what you get uh, in the case of the circumbinary disk, uh, <clears throat> circumbinary disk in, in, in the common sense. Because the usual circumbinary disk, like the one uh, shown in this figure, is rotationally supported in its motion around the binary. Whereas uh, the disk, which is uh, the disk into which the binary is embedded, is not. This disk uh, is showing this uh, sheared motion. There is a constant velocity shear around this binary, and the binary in its, uh, is uh, orbiting and doing uh, very interesting things outside of the heliosphere and inside of, its, of its heliosphere. Outside of, of the heliosphere, it's uh, launching the standard usual uh, spiral density waves. Uh, that propagate uh, in a, a bulk of the disk, but inside of uh, inside of the Hill sphere, it might be launching this uh, its own small spiral arms. And uh, obviously, the orbital evolution of this binary, its coupling to this disk, would be quite different uh, from what we would expect um, from what we expect uh, in the usual circumbinary uh, cases. And there is a, there has been a lot of interesting work in this area by. Uh, Lee and Lai, by uh, Lee et al. Uh, in 2021, and so on, and previously by, by Barreto and the collaborators uh, as well. So I look forward to more to, to more developments uh, in this area in the, the years to come. Okay, now let me uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, some historical perspectives uh, on uh, theoretical studies of the circumbinary disks. Uh, and what I'll do here is I'll just uh, list uh, some of the papers which I think uh, played an important uh, role uh, in this uh, subject. Being an introductory uh, sort of talk for the conference, I think uh, I uh, am allowed uh, to do that. So I believe that one of the one of the sort of most influential papers in this uh, area, which kind of kickstarted uh, this uh, whole subject and the interest in this subject, is this paper by Pavel Artimovic and Stephen Lubo uh, from 19. 90, um, 1994, basically. Uh, this is a paper that first uh, presented the 
to my mind, to my knowledge, the first uh, SPH simulation of a circumbinary disk, uh, obviously not running for very long, just several dozen of orbits, but showing the main uh, features of this uh, process. Uh, the fact that the binary by its gravitational effect is clearing out a cavity uh, around uh, its orbit and uh, pr provides, uh, provides uh, the existence of this, you know, nice, uh, clean space in which you can still see some streamers uh, through which uh, particles do penetrate into the cavity and might get accreted by the binary components. This paper also had a very important uh, analytical prediction for the size of this cavity where they considered different uh, Lindblad resonances, considered uh, the torque exerted uh, onto the disk at these Lindblad resonances, equated it to the viscous torque and came up with the predictions for the cavity size, which I think was a very um, uh, sort of uh, far looking uh, calculation and it still is being used quite uh, uh, frequently in estimating the sizes of circumbinary disks. Uh, possibly triggered by this uh, work, there has been uh, then uh, several interesting uh, studies, uh, sort of uh, more on an analytical side. For example, this paper by Siren Clark that looked at, uh, that obtained self similar solutions uh, for a moderately massive perturber, which is not opening a whole, whole cavity, but actually is opening a gap. It's like a type two migration of a planet. Uh, uh, they obtained a self-similar solution for this case. And uh, in, if you think about it, this uh, might be similar to a sort of a low mass, uh, to a high mass ratio binary, uh, binary supermassive black hole. Um, a more focused study on that topic was uh, done in 1999 by Ivanov, Papaloiz and Polnareov, who actually looked uh, at the problem, uh, of more general problem of uh, binaries with mass ratio of uh, potentially going up to uh, of order unity. Uh, what, they, what they have done is, uh, first of all, they obtained a self-similar solution for such a case for a disk viscously uh, evolving in time and demonstrated this, uh, that, uh, well, if you prevent accretion to happen uh, onto, the, onto the black hole, then uh, the disk will actually be building up mass in the inner disk. That was actually somewhat borne out by uh, these calculations uh, in, uh, in uh, Artemovitz and Lubo because you can see that the cavity is very clean and it looks like uh, there is a truncation of the mass flow onto the binary. And if you do suppress mass uh, flow, which was kind of natural at the time because people believe that gravitational torque is extremely strong, it's going to push away the matter, uh, matter away from the, from the binary and prevent it from being accreted, that assumption seemed uh, to be okay uh, at the time. They also did uh, this paper, Ivanov, Popolois et al, uh, also looked at uh, the case of a misaligned binary and came up with probably the first prediction for uh, how the inclination angle, the twist angle in the circumbinary disk would be uh, behaving as a function of uh, the radius uh, from, from the center of the binary. So this was one of the pioneering studies uh, in this uh, area. <clears throat> Uh, and then uh, in 2008, uh, there was uh, another paper that kind of caught my uh, attention, a uh, paper by Andrew McFadden and Milos Milosavlevich, probably because I knew these people quite well, and some of them were sitting in the offices uh, next to me. Um, and this paper uh, presented the, probably the first very long-term exploration of the problem of the evolution of the circumbinary disk around uh, around the uh, around the binary. And uh, not only did it uh, study this long-term evolution, it also provided uh, some very interesting uh, uh, diagnostics, diagnostics which are important for theorists uh, to interpret. For example, uh, it showed that the cavity, uh, the cavity around the supermassive black hole becomes eccentric and they measure the eccentricity, they measure the radial run of the eccentricity in the disk. Uh, they also measured the behavior of the, tor of the, of the torque, of this gravitational torque that uh, is uh, going to be truncating uh, the disk. And this is uh, the torque density. It shows this oscillatory behavior. And then the, the integrated torque embedded, uh, sort of the angular momentum flux in the waves injected into the disk, in the density waves injected into the disk, is shown by this uh, curve that saturates uh, at large uh, distances. In this particular study, they did find that uh, uh, some mass accretion was happening on a binary, but there was a suppression of this and dot by about a factor of five. Uh, obviously, as you well know, this is a very uh, kind of hot uh, issue right now, whether there is any suppression or uh, mass uh, is allowed to fully penetrate into the disk. So I'm sure there will still be a lot of discussions of that issue during the conference as well. And then, you know, the... Um, 
I could say, you know, it, it was like an opening of a Pandora box and there was a lot of uh, different simulations have followed that studied the same topic. These, uh, let's say, MHD, these uh, GR MHD with uh, various types of the moving mesh codes that allow you to actually go uh, into the cavity. For example, in this uh, code, the DISCO, or in this code, a REPO, actually, and when you are going into the cavity, you don't need to put in any sort of sink particles, so you don't need to put any uh, cutout region. You can actually study the physics of the mini disks, the disks that form uh, as a result of uh, matter being accreted uh, onto each individual component of the binary, which is uh, very uh, important another topic uh, in this uh, area. Okay, let me quickly run you through uh, the di differences between uh, the properties of the circumbinary disks and the sort of the usual disks. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, circumbinary disks uh, have, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the circumbinary disks is the presence of this uh, gravitational torque. And so if I were to write down the 1D equation of the viscous evolution of, for, for the disk, so doing things in an azimuthally average sense, uh, then, you know, one thing that I would get uh, uh, in addition to the usual equation would be this uh, term with a binary, uh, with a binary torque. But as you have seen in this uh, image, for example, this binary torque decays very, very quickly as we uh, move away from uh, the binary. And so what it means is that at some large, at some relatively, well, let's say at four semi-major axis from the binary, you can pretty much neglect uh, uh, this torque because it becomes uh, too small. And in this case, what you can do is you can simplify this equation. You can take this equation and forget about uh, this term in the outer parts uh, of the disk. So let's suppose that I'm interested in what happens to the binary uh, outside of this, you know, torque, uh, strong torque regime, uh, in which case I could drop this uh, term. Uh, in, and if I do some interesting substitutions instead, for example, instead of the radius, I use a specific angular momentum, uh, omega times R squared. And instead of the surface density, I use the viscous angular momentum flux, which for a Keplerian disk is just given by 3 pi nu uh, viscosity times sigma omega r squared. In this case, uh, this equation uh, reduces to a very simple diffusion type uh, form. It looks like del by del t, fj divided by a modified diffusion coefficient given by this uh, formula times the second derivative of this uh, fj. And the beauty of this uh, form of the viscous evolution equation is that in steady state, uh, when the left-hand side is zero, this equation adopts a very, very simple solution. It's just a linear function. It's just a linear function of L, of the specific angular momentum. These two constant factors, Fj0 and Fj1. So let me now show, you know, what happens when we uh, <clears throat> kind of consider sort of this, uh, this solution. So this here, here again is this, uh, uh, is this very simple solution with this constant coefficients. We also know from the theory of steady state disks uh, that uh, M dot, uh, that mass accretion rate of a disk uh, is given by that formula. So if I take a derivative of uh, this solution for Fj, then I immediately see that uh, M dot through the disk is given by this Fj1. So this constant, the value of this constant Fj1 is fixed by the M dot, by the mass accretion rate from the disk, which is set by some conditions, let's say, at infinity. And now uh, there is a kind of thing split when we now consider the conventional constant M dot disk uh, or uh, the circumbinary constant M dot disk. Because in a conventional constant M dot disk, it turns out that this, uh, we need to set this uh, constant Fj0 to zero. That means that uh, there is no torque in the center of the disk, that uh, there is no injection of angular momentum in the center of the disk. And then in this case, if, uh, you know, I calculate M dot, if I take this derivative, I would find that M dot is 3 pi nu sigma, a classical expression from the accretion disk theory, and uh, my temperature of the disk is given by that uh, expression. At the same time, if I consider the uh, circumbinary disk, in this case, Fj0 is not equal to zero. It can be positive, it can be negative. And M dot, uh, you know, for a constant M dot, I have the following behavior relating uh, uh, surface density and Fj0. And you can see that as I move into the inner part of the disk towards smaller values of the uh, angular momentum, specific angular momentum, uh, this is where the impact of this Fj not being uh, zero would be the most important. 
And it would also modify the temperature presence of this term would also modify the temperature structure uh, of uh, the disk. So I don't have uh, much uh, time left, but let me just uh, uh, probably, you know, one of the last uh, slides uh, that I'm going to cover, uh, talk about some implications of this for the orbital uh, evolution and uh, for these recent uh, claims about the orbital evolution, whether it leads to expansion or contraction of the binary. Apparently, because of the conservation of angular momentum, the momentum gained by the disk has to be lost by the binary. And vice versa, if the binary is actually gaining angular momentum, the disk has to lose, uh, lose angular momentum. One can write down the equation for the evolution of the binary semi-major axis. You know, I've done it in my paper in 2016. Many people have done it in their own uh, ways. Here Q is uh, evolution of the mass ratio of the binary, and you can find some, something equivalent in many other papers. So, um, right, so, uh, and FJ0 is uh, just, you know, and ends up being the negative of the change of the binary angular uh, momentum in this uh, setup. Uh, so this picture is showing these different possibilities, you know, the solution with this, uh, when there is, uh, you know, at large distances, we have the usual constant m uh, dot disk, but then depending on the value of this uh, constant fj0, we can have either a uh, sort of pile up of uh, uh, angular momentum flux, in which case we will have higher surface density of the disk uh, than in the absence of this uh, fj0, or if FJ zero is uh, less than zero, then we have uh, then we have basically you know the disk that dips down, so that there is a reduction in the surface density of uh, the disk. So recent results by Miranda et al. and uh, also Munoz and Moody and others uh, have suggested that the binary actually should be expanding, and that means that if the binary is expanding, it's gaining angular momentum. If it's gaining angular momentum, that implies that this FJ0 is actually very uh, strongly negative. Uh, and so in this case, uh, you know, we would be uh, on this uh, track uh, in this, uh, you know, plots of the behavior of the angular momentum flux as a function of radius. So what uh, these uh, studies would suggest is that uh, the surface density of the disk should be suppressed compared to the standard accretion disk with just a point mass in the center. And I think this is a very interesting prediction that uh, should be uh, potentially tested in these uh, simulations. At the same time, I will also say that uh, there, is a, there is a different work uh, recently, for example, by Chris Tidian and collaborators that looks uh, at the thermal effects in uh, circumbinary disks. For example, at disks is very low uh, values of the sound speed uh, and very high Mach numbers, which finds that this behavior uh, that the binary is actually shrinking should be, is changing. It is a function of um, the Mach number uh, and the colder is the flow. Uh, the I mean, there is, a, there is a certain transition and binary actually starts shrinking when the flow becomes uh, cold enough. So since I'm running out of time, I'll probably skip the last part of uh, the talk uh, uh, about the formation of the Tatooines and the role of um, disk eccentricity. And uh, I will just uh, pass on to this list of, I, I will not have a formal summary, but just a list of uh, problems which I think are sort of interesting and important in this field. And I hope uh, that this problem will be discussed uh, throughout uh, the rest of this week and throughout the rest of this uh, program. Uh, these problems are related uh, in many ways uh, to each other. For example, you know, we have just seen that the evolution of the semi-major axis of the binary is intricately related uh, to what's uh, happening in the disk. I would also say that things like uh, disk thermodynamics are also important for this uh, uh, evolution of the uh, semi-major axis. It's also important for the accretion by the binary components, you know, how efficient it is and so on and so forth. Eccentricity of the binary is uh, strongly related to what eccentricity will be developed in the disk. And the development of the disk eccentricity projects on many um, well, on many other uh, aspects uh, of uh, that whole problem. For example, uh, how modulated in time would be the equation by the binary components. Uh, if you're talking about protoplanetary disks, that projects into how excited would be planetesimal populations there, and so on and so forth. So I uh, will leave you uh, at this, and uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. All right. Thank you. That was that was a really excellent overview. So we have two microphones on each side, and I have one here. So if people want to, if people have questions and they want to start um, 
Looks like Yanfei's. Do you want to start, Yanfei, or are you just going to move the mic? Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, yes. Go ahead. There's a mic right there. Okay. Well, the honor of the first question of the conference. Uh, hi, Roman. Uh, Alberto Susana here. I, I think I, I lost you maybe toward the end when you showed this very nice analytical description of the circumbinary disk. So you, if I understood correctly, you put the oscillatory uh, torque term to zero, right? Assuming that it's small enough. Yes. And so this, this, this is valid, you know, sort of, let's say, uh, out in the in the disk. So I was wondering whether uh, this makes any difference, whether, you know, there is a way to include this part also in the analytical description or not. Well, so uh, the answer to this question is that uh, presence of this uh, term, uh, you know, historically was especially important. It was especially important. Sorry, not 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 this term, but uh, b basically what I'm what I'm doing over here is I'm trying I'm I'm dropping out this term and I'm completely absorbing the effect of this term into sort of a different boundary condition on a simpler equation. So this is a simpler equation, which I'm uh, solving sort of in, you know, outside of this uh, torque dominated region, but then I need to specify a certain, uh, certain boundary condition. And so what's, uh, what's happening is that, you know, if, if the boundary were presenting, a, sorry, if the binary were presenting a strong sort of gravitational dam, as it was, uh, there's the term that I think by Benza Kosic in uh, 2012. Um, in, this, in this case, you would be getting accumulation of uh, mass uh, in the disk. So the mass, uh, mass, mass, and actually the angular momentum flux will be building up uh, with time. So it would be growing higher and higher and higher, uh, and that would affect uh, the evolution of a large portion of a disk. Eventually, you know, this radius of influence would be propagating further and further, and changing disk properties over larger and larger distances in the disk. That would be very, very important. This is probably not so uh, much the case if, if the binary actually is allowed to expand, because in this case, uh, this uh, constant FJ0 is negative. And actually, you know, the disk has to somehow get more and more truncated, uh, suppressing the effect of this, uh, tor of this uh, torque density, of this torque injection. So there is only uh, so in the opposite case when the binary is, is expanding, you you can only go uh, a little bit. Uh, I mean, basically, the value of, of this uh, of this constant FJ zero cannot uh, become uh, too large, and so uh, in in that case, uh, the separation between you know this torque dominated zone and the uh, zone for the free accretional evolution is not uh, so clear, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, next up we have Dong Lai. And can I just say for everybody who speaks, um, please, if I don't do it, make sure you introduce yourself so that the online audience knows who's talking. Thanks. Hi. Hi, Roman. Greeting, and this is Dong. Yeah, I hope hey, everything's Dong. well, <laughs> everything's good for you on your side, yeah. Uh, I have a question about the post-AGB uh, binary in the disk. Um, yeah. I'm wondering what's the, what's the origin of that disk? Is this really a Christian disk from outside in? you know, coming from outside or rather sort of excretion this where the gas is coming from basically leakage of gas from the, the L2 point and that kind of thing, because I would imagine there could be, the behavior could be quite different. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I also, you know, in general, I, I think people may know more about this. Over the years, many people, whenever people study binary evolutions, right? Whenever they need the mechanisms of orbital decay, they often invoke, oh, there's some stuff coming out, you know, coming out from L2 point, you know, the disk, and therefore that, that can make them decay. So I, I mean, this seems to be a different class of kind of disk. I'm, I'm wondering, again, for this post-AGB binary disk, what's the origin, what's the general thinking about those disks? And, the, oh. and also what's the thinking about this, whether the, what do you think this, the behavior of a Christian disk versus excretion disk, are they expected to be the same? People, this may be a different kind of disk. Yeah. 
So obviously, in this case, it would be an excretion disk. Yes. Uh, how how is this form? This disk formed is basically. I mean, it's not very obvious. For example, the initial masses of these disks are not very uh, clear. I mean, we just measure them in observations. For example, by measuring the dust the dust emission and getting some idea of uh, the underlying uh, disk mass. But the you know this is this is a this is a bind. I mean, this is a post AGB uh, star. It's not a pot. It's post AGB star. Um, so effectively, it was losing a lot of mass. It was losing a substantial fraction of its own mass at some point uh, in the past. And in the process of doing this, some of this gap, gas might have been uh, left uh, behind. So this is what, what is the idea for the origin of uh, this uh, circumbinary disk. So it's just, you know, the gas, I mean, presumably it was a roughly spherically symmetric flow, of course, modular the fact that uh, this flow is happening from one of the components in the binary. And then probably because of that, there was a loss of angular momentum and some of this material got trapped uh, in the circumbinary disk. So the, or the origin of that uh, of that uh, in these disks uh, of, of these disks is probably somehow related to, to this uh, process. And then you talk about the possibility of you know pumping binary eccentricity, uh, orbital evolution, for example, shrinking the semi major axis of the binary, and so on uh, and so forth. By the way, I should uh, mention that there is a similar class of systems which are um, neutron star white dwarf binaries with periods around uh, 30 days. Uh, so these binaries typically have uh, Surprisingly high eccentricities, according to the Stirl's uh, theory back from uh, uh, the 1990s, uh, such binaries should have tiny eccentricities at the level of 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 5. Uh, however, these systems have eccentricities of order several percent. And one of the uh, uh, interesting ideas was that uh, there was, you know, in the late uh, phases of uh, the uh, evolution of uh, this pre-white dwarf uh, uh, star, there was a kind of thermal pulse or something that uh, lost a substantial amount of mass uh, that formed a circumbinary disk around this neutron star white dwarf binary and actually through the same mechanism through excitation of binary eccentricity gave rise to the eccentricities of several percent. Uh, I mean, I'm not claiming that you know, I fully believe in this uh, idea. Again, you know, the uh, reasons uh, why that might be difficult is because the disk mass typically is too low and the binary is still uh, too massive for that uh, to work out. But obviously more work would need to be done in the future on that on that front. All right, thanks. Um, before we turn to Zoltan, are there any graduate students or postdocs in the audience who have a question? All right, I'm coming. Oh, there we go. Yes, excellent, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Bhupen Namisha, uh, postdoc from Los Alamos Lab. Uh, since you brought up the question about white dwarf neutron star, I thought there are GRMHD models when you have two neutron stars with a different magnetic field or different rotation, still they keep merging uh, if you evolve them. So how is it different in this particular one where the debate is about expands or contracts? Is there some missing physics from those models to here? Sorry, uh, you're talking about the GRMHD models of merging uh, neutron stars? Yeah, so these are the models where you play with the spin off neutron stars or magnetic uh -huh. field. Uh -huh. At any configuration, they end yeah. up merging. Right. So, so obviously, you know, this this uh, neutron star white dwarf binaries. I mean, these are sort of very highly degenerate objects and moderately degenerate objects. They are very different objects. They are not uh, merging. They are well uh, separated from each other. They are in periods of about 30 days. So it's a substantial uh, radial separation uh, between them. Uh, at the moment when we observe them, these objects are not, uh, they are not accreting. But at some point uh, before the white dwarf actually became a white dwarf, it was a, a giant, uh, it was a giant star. So because it was a giant star, uh, slowly accreting mass onto the neutron star, the expectation is that it should have been circularized. It should have been tidally circularized. And that's not what we see. So th this is uh, this alternative mechanism uh, that I was just uh, describing. So I think it, it's, uh, you know, what you're talking about is somewhat different from uh, the setup uh, which uh, I uh, just mentioned here. All right, thanks. Uh, Zoltan, go ahead. All right. Hi, Roman. This is Zoltan. Thanks. That was a great Hi, overview. I wish we could talk in person here and hope things are okay there. So I actually had a question very similar to Dong Lai's, but maybe I'll still ask it because in the, in, in the recent paper with John, led by Jonathan Zrake, 
we looked at the eccentricity distribution for the post AGB stars, and it was really intriguing because it's actually by model. And when you do the hydro simulations, you predict exactly that. The, exactly E equals zero stays E equals zero. Slight eccentricity binaries would be driven up to about 0.4. It's not obvious from the plot you have on the screen, but, but it, maybe we had a slightly different sample, but it was bimodal. So we really thought this is a telltale sign of a certain binary disk determining these eccentricities. So question I had was more specific maybe than Dong's. Could it actually be that the low mass now is just a remnant? You had actually enough mass in the past, uh, either from the mass loss or from outside and that actually did drive the eccentricities. And then now we just don't see the disk because it's either accreted or was blown away. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, is this, that's, is this that's, not a possibility? Right. So that's definitely, a, that's definitely a possibility. If you look at this HR diagram, uh, the times here are indicated. I believe this is in thousand years. So the time scale is actually very, very short, the time scale for this uh, evolution. So if uh, you know if any disk uh, if any massive disk was forming, it would probably be uh, kind of expanding on a very uh, on a very uh, long time scale on a viscous time scale, uh, and so you know on these time scales that we see these uh, stars basically evolving and cooling, we presumably would have still uh, seen these disks uh, present. Another question is that uh, the efficiency of this excitation might probably depend uh, on the degree of re accretion of, you know, how effectively this uh, gas in the disk is getting re accreted back onto the back onto the binary. Uh, so I'm I, 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 I'm apologize I haven't uh, I'm not familiar with this paper that you mentioned. I'll definitely look it up and uh, have a look at it. Uh, but it just uh, uh, you know. If, if you basically my, my guess is that if you're saying that the disk was much more massive, let's say, you know, 0 0.1 solar mass, and so it could have uh, potentially absorbed the, uh, this, this amount of angular momentum, which obviously would be uh, easier if the periods of the binaries were smaller. Here we are talking about, you know, thousand day periods. So there is a lot of angular momentum deficit that you need to absorb uh, into the disk. My guess is that we would still see some uh, evidence, I don't know, like emission lines from this gaseous component of the disk or more extended, uh, uh, more extended uh, dusty disk uh, than what we see right now. All right, thanks. Um, Roman, quick question. Are you gonna be around for the discussion session in, a, in an hour and a half or so, or are you? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, we have a couple more questions here, but I think we can defer those to the session so we stay on time. Thank you. Um, uh, and I think we will turn it. Thank you again for that excellent introduction. Let's give uh, Roman another round of applause.